More and more of us want to make informed decisions about where our money goes when it comes to climate change. We want to do things like avoiding buying from companies that harm the environment. But to do that, we need the right information. This is where climate disclosures come in. It's all about transparency and making sure companies and institutions are clear about what climate change means for them. Disclosures help us take climate-related issues into account in the decisions we make every day. Here at the ECB, we recently published a couple of important documents. First, as banking supervisor, we published our third report on the progress that banks have been making in becoming more transparent when it comes to climate. And second, for the first time, we published details of the carbon footprint of our monetary policy operations. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm very happy to welcome Frank Elderson back to the podcast. Frank, you're here again wearing your two hats. So as a, an executive board member and supervisory board vice chair, and that's because we'll be covering both monetary policy and banking supervision aspects of the topic. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Katie. I'm, I'm very glad to be back. Now, in our conversation today, Frank, I, I want to talk about quite a few different things about climate disclosures. I want us to talk about what they are and, and why we need them at all, why they're helpful. But I also want to talk about why they matter for us as a central bank and, and what we're doing to help ensure transparency around climate impact and exposure. Let's start then with the basics. What are climate disclosures? Sure. Well, climate disclosures, um, I would say our data, our details is information that organizations such as companies, institutions, banks publish. Publish about mainly two things. The effect that these organizations have on climate change and also the other way around. So the effect that climate change has on them. And, you know, disclosures is, you know, it's a fancy word, but it, you know, it can take many forms. So you can think of a report or a simple web page or any, actually, basically, you know, any kind of public public communication. Okay. The important thing is that it's it's disclosed to the public, essentially. Exactly. Okay. And what do we need them for? Why are they helpful? Well, basically, to get better informed decisions and for risk management. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so better climate information helps all of us. So when I say all of us, I mean you as a consumer, uh, me as a central banker, an investor, a business owner, non-governmental organizations, mm. um, anyone practically, to make more informed decisions. So I was thinking of an example to, to make that a little bit more, you know, down to earth. Think, for example, and I think most of um, you know, um, our listeners will 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 recognize this. Think of nutrition labels on food. Mm. Um, so people use this to to make a choice between healthy and less healthy or uh, yeah. unhealthy food. Yeah. Um, now climate disclosures are actually much the same. So they help us understand which are the greener options and which are the non green options. Um, and if we all take notice of that information that we get. Then, and that is, of course, the whole thinking behind it, then more money will flow into activities and technologies that are better for the environment. That's one thing. The other thing is that disclosures also help us to spot risks and risks of doing business with certain companies or, of course, you know, in our purview, banks. Mm. So, for example, again, an example, a company with high green green greenhouse gas emissions might run into trouble if new climate policies force that company to change its its business practices this is a what we call a transition risk exactly mm. so so one day the last coal mine will close one day you know and you and I will see that day that there will no be no more diesel cars on the streets of frankfurt mm. or fossil cars you know more generally to just give you two two examples um, so if you own shares in a company uh, or if you lend uh, to a company as a bank that 
is affected by these transition risks, as we indeed call them, uh, then you might lose a lot of money. Mm. And disclosures, and this is the, the key point here, disclosures help you spot that risk before so that you can take your measures before it's too late. Okay, so disclosures are important for a, a lot of different people in that sense. It's quite interesting what you were saying about the, the nutrition labels because in the UK now they have to put calories on menus and there's a, a new discussion about putting the climate impact of, of certain foods and, and some, some restaurants have actually started doing it and, and there are studies that say it's really helpful uh, for people to choose the less carbon well, the, the the option on the menu that has a, a lesser carbon impact. I would certainly be guided by that. I can tell you if I saw that in a restaurant. <laughs> now, when it comes to disclosing climate information, we, we hear a lot about something called greenwashing. And what this basically means is that companies, also including banks, disclose misleading information that makes their activities look greener than they, they really are. And... By doing that, they also make their products seem more environmentally friendly to customers, so more attractive. And, and they are often accused of this in, in the media. So given the risk of this, and also given the reality that we hear in the media that this does happen, what exactly can we do to make sure that disclosures actually work, that, 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 that we can trust them essentially? Right. Well, greenwashing is indeed a concern. And I would say specifically because of the impact uh, that it has. So if information that is disclosed claims that practices or activities are more environmentally friendly or sustainable than they actually are, or if they misrepresent how firms are managing their climate-related risks, then this will mislead customers and the wider market. And... And it's not just, by the way, just representing. Also, and all of us have heard those, you know, daring and visionary statements like, we will be pairs aligned by a certain date. Mm. Um, they are often made without the proper plans in place um, to make sure that this will actually then be delivered upon, that this will actually happen. So they just say it, they, they put this nice big statement out there, but there's nothing or not enough behind it. Exactly. So the ambition mm. is excellent. And um, and I would say you know, but it's 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 crucial that organizations just don't don't just make green sounds, yeah. but that they act green, that they deliver, that they are as green as they pretend to be. Now, disclosures about climate risks influence the decisions of of millions of people in the in in the economy. So this is a real issue as investors become increasingly interested, as they do in green finance and place more importance on climate and environmental concerns. And as climate change becomes more intense and widespread, we just, you know, we, we cannot afford uh, to delay that green transition any longer, can we? Okay, so it's really time is of the essence, but what can we do then to, to help tackle this problem of greenwashing? Sure. Well, I think there's a number of key things that could help combat this, or, or to put it more positively, that can contribute greatly to sound and relevant disclosures. So, so I think earlier I said that disclosures can take many forms, but in terms of the actual content, they should actually not be different. Um, so consistency and a mandatory global reporting standard for climate-related disclosures is actually key. And let me just give you some examples here. So the Financial Stability Board Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, TCFD for The sure, TCFD so for those who have, you know, um, looked into this a little bit more. But it's a task force of the Financial Stability Board. Um, has issued recommendations about a consistent approach for companies and banks. And having this global baseline, if you like, for disclosures will ensure that information on the impact of climate change is comparable and is consistent and can therefore be reliably taken into account for investment, lending, and insurance um, decisions. 
that's the point, isn't it? If it's not consistent, then, you know, you might have investors in Europe and investors in the US with different levels of information and, um, you know, an investor who's working in both jurisdictions will not be able to to have a clear picture of all of all of the options open to them. Exactly. So this is why these recommendations by the TCFD are so, so important. But also... Um, um, on the European level, we see um, very important developments here. So we have this, uh, what we call the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which actually requires companies to issue annual sustainability reports. And the European Sustainability Reporting Standards outline how and what information uh, companies, but also banks and insurance companies, then need to report. So this is more of a requirement part here. Right. So you have this directive, Mm. you have um, reporting standards, and then um, the European Banking Authority, so sorry for throwing all these these, these different fora at you, but it shows how much is going on right now and why this is such a topical topical issue. So the European Banking Authority has recently published binding climate risk disclosure standards for banks. And this will make it easier uh, to compare banks across Europe. And then um, I talked a little bit about Europe, uh, and I mentioned the TCFD. Uh, but you know, further on a global level, uh, there um, is the International Sustainability Standards Board, and that board is working on similar standards that would then apply beyond Europe, and help make disclosures more comparable across different countries. So. Standards determining which economic activities are sustainable, which are green, are crucial for reliable, meaningful, and comparable uh, disclosures. And actually, there's another um, um, concept that I want to throw at you. The EU taxonomy is also a very good example of this, as is the future European Green Bond Standard, Mm. uh, which will determine when... Um, such a label when a bond can be called a green bond according to this European green bond standard. Um, But to be as impactful as possible, these standards should then be ideally, of course, in the end, global and mandatory. And they, um, you know, they will help to improve the quality and the availability of data on climate-related risks, which will um, also be useful for other companies and banks to use uh, in their disclosures. So, Banks build on the disclosures by, you know, the real economy firms that are their clients. So they need to disclose and then the banks need to disclose. And then this whole system ideally should be global and mandatory. So in a nutshell, everyone needs to do it, but they all need to do it in the same way as well. Yes. And, you know, and we can't just stand by and wait um, for all these standards being developed. In the meantime, we all need to work with the tools and the information that, that, that we have to improve and expand on our disclosures and to keep pushing forward the green transition. And, you know, and in this sense, a patchy data is a good start. So so saying, you know, it's not ideal yet is not an excuse for inaction. Okay, Frank, I want to zoom in on one of the groups that you've just um, been mentioning a bit there in, in your answer, and that's banks. Now, we supervise Europe's banks to make sure that they are safe and sound. And that's exactly why we want them to be aware of the climate-related risks that, that they are exposed to, like giving out a lot of loans to companies in, in carbon-intensive sectors or, or located in areas at risk from the effects of climate change. But we also want them to be transparent about them to their customers and investors. And and this will help them avoid financial, operational and and even reputational risks. So it goes back to that risk management that you were talking about earlier. Now, Frank, as I, I mentioned in the introduction, we've just published our third report on the progress that banks have made in becoming more transparent when it comes to climate. Now, this report looked at disclosures for a total of 131 banks. And and it looked at some key areas, including their business model, uh, their strategy, governance, and and how they manage that risk. So, Frank, what did we find? How are banks doing on this front? Okay, well, this is indeed the third consecutive year that we do this. And, And I think, you know, by now, I would say it's both a good news and a bad news story. The good news, and let me start there. Um, is that banks are disclosing much more. 
So to make that very, very specific, uh, in just one year, so compared to last year, the percentage of major banks disclosing their exposures to climate and environmental risks went from 36% to 86%. That's huge. That's so a huge So that, that's a very significant jump. Um, so that's the good news. Mm. Um, but the quality of these um, disclosures is still lacking and not in line with what we expect um, from them as their, their supervisor. So, for example, whilst half of the banks provide information on the amount of emissions they finance through their business, in many cases, this information is still incomplete, it's unspecific, or it's not properly substantiated. And this needs to change. And there are new EU rules on, on climate um, uh, disclosures. I, I just gave you some, uh, some examples. Um, and they will come into force uh, this year. And, and right now, the information that banks are providing is not enough to comply uh, with these new rules. Um, and this is just one of the examples of the, um, uh, of the minimum standards um, uh, I gave when we talked about the greenwashing. So if needed, we will take the appropriate action as supervisor to ensure that banks comply. And the consequences of not complying with minimum uh, transparency standards are only going to increase for banks. Um, because you already mentioned a little bit, you know, there are legal and reputational risks that start to emerge for banks as more and more clients, investors, and other stakeholders and market participants want meaningful, comprehensive information. Um, on climate-related risk, and, and also, and this is key, corresponding matching action by the banks. Okay, so you've published these results, but what about the banks themselves? Well, what have you asked them to do about it? Right, well, you know, when we do such a review, what we then do is we go back to the banks individually, we inform them of our findings, and we ask them, we told them, to address these um, shortcomings. And we have also, and that is um, because we also feel we need to help. So as a supervisor, we look at all these banks and we look in the kitchen, if you like, of each of the banks, and we are able to see good practices. So in order to help, because in the end, what we want is to move the whole banking system in the right direction, don't we? And um, so we, we, we see good practices, we publish those. Um, this is kind of like a living document. So also in the future, when we see better practices emerging, we will also publish those mm -hmm. to help banks um, on the other hand. Okay, Frank, I want to turn the spotlight onto the other side of the ECB's work, which is your second hat that you have, I mentioned. In addition to supervising banks, it's also our job to ensure price stability. Now, when we design the policies for carrying out that task, we, we need to take into account the effect that climate change has on the economy but also the effects that our own operations might have on the climate transition and, and the risks that we are exposed to as a central bank. Now, that's why in October of last year, 2022, we started shifting, or in the jargon, tilting our asset purchases towards issuers with a better climate performance. And here we've been looking at companies with lower greenhouse gas emissions, more ambitious carbon reduction targets, and, and also better disclosures, which just goes to show how important that is. Now, Frank, to what extent are we ourselves actually disclosing the kind of information that, that we've been discussing and that's actually useful to us? Very good question, uh, Katie. So, so we are making various contributions uh, to support our efforts to align with the Paris compatible transition path. So, so one of these actually began very recently in March uh, of this year, uh, 2023, when for the first time we published information about the carbon footprint and the exposures to climate risks of some of the assets that we hold. And when I say assets, I mean things like the corporate bonds that your system central banks bought in recent years as part of our monetary policy. So these disclosures give us a first picture of where we stand in the decarbonization of our portfolios. And they are um, really a, I would say, important piece of the puzzle in 
getting a clear view on our efforts to contribute to the fight against climate change and a key commitment of the Climate Change Action Plan that we agreed on and published in 2021. We'll certainly link to that in in the show notes of the podcast. Now, this decarbonisation that you talked about basically means making the portfolios less carbon intensive in terms of the emissions that they're linked to. So what have the disclosures actually shown? Well, this this first set of disclosures uh, shows, I would say, encouraging signs of progress. So, so for example, we see that um, what we call the carbon intensity of the companies that we buy bonds from has gradually declined over time. So this means that the emissions of these investments relative to their size have decreased. In other words, companies have become more carbon efficient with their activities. And together with our efforts to buy more bonds from better climate performance, so this is this tilting or shifting Mm -hmm. that you refer to in your question, Katie, um, this has had a clear impact on the carbon footprint of the investments uh, investments by the central banks across the, um, the euro area. Well, and, and the disclosures also show that since 2019, we have more than halved emissions from the large part of the investments that we made using our staff pension fund and increased the share of green bonds from what was actually only just 1% in 2019 to 13% in 2022. So we will be publishing these disclosures every year and over time include also some of the other assets that we hold. Mm. And, you know, they are very useful as they will help us steer the reduction of emissions of our asset holdings. To be very honest, um, now that we have announced that as of July we will no longer be reinvesting any maturing bonds, we will have to reassess what action we need to undertake to ensure alignment with the Paris-compatible transition path. As President Lagarde also mentioned in the most recent press conference, by becoming more transparent about the climate impact of our investments and our holdings, we can and will contribute to paving a clearer pathway towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. Well, Frank, we've covered a lot of ground today, but thank you once again for another fascinating conversation. It's always a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Pleasure's uh, mine. As you always know, before we wrap up, we ask our guests a question before they leave, and that's for a hot tip linked to the topic that we've been discussing today. So broadly speaking, transparency and, and climate change. Frank, have you thought of something? Yes, well, I... I had to think a little bit because I was first I was hoping that I could find kind of like a, a song that I like that deals with transparency. But then I thought, you know, actually what we are talking about is not just transparency, but it's also honesty, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So then Billy Joel's honesty came to my mind. So that's one thing. But then I was also thinking, you know, I gave this speech um, um, last Friday, also climate related. And um, and there, there was one sentence I mentioned, which was that everyone within their mandate should do all um, he or she can to contribute to combating the, the twin climate and environmental crises. So, of course, us within our mandate as a central bank and a supervisor, but actually everyone. And then I was thinking, you know, you told me just before we started um, this conversation that, you know, the average age of the listeners is about 30. So I was thinking there must be among the listeners, those who are now thinking about, you know, what is the children's books that I want to read to my children? And so actually my whole tip is the following, that whenever you buy children's books or ask them, for, you know, for the grandparents to give for, for your children's birth or whatever, um, you can also think about do they deal with these issues? Do they instill love for the climate and for, for the environment in, in children? Just a little bit like the nutritional things that we talked about or the you know the disclosure. So here you go. It's maybe a little bit of a, a long thought process, but it brought me back by you know the next generation and how we teach them how crucially and vitally important the environment and the climate is. Well, You say it's a long thought process, but it's a very tangible and concrete thing that we can all do. So I think it's a perfect hot tip. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you, Katie.
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Frank Elderson, who sits on the ECB's executive board and is the vice chair of our supervisory board, for joining the conversation today and sharing his thoughts. Listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for further reading on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.